Uh, today's lecture is going to be investigation in a patient with musculoskeletal complaint. And why do we need, need investigation of a patient who is having rheumatic complaints such as joint pain, muscle pain or any other symptom such as skin rash or presenting with systemic features. We need lab support to confirm a diagnosis, exclude a diagnosis, monitor treatment, assess damage and these include blood, hematology, immunological and images like ultrasound, CR or computerized radiography or MRI. Now let's try to categorize patients who present with musculoskeletal complaint. Either they can have acute monoarthritis or chronic monoarthritis or have asymmetrical oligoarthritis, backache, chronic polyarthritis, systemic features with or without arthritis, skin rash, renos, cirrhositis or muscle weakness. Now monoarthritis, that single joint that is affected. Acute or subacute, that means the duration of symptoms is less than six weeks. Um, the most important approach to diagnosing these conditions to distinguish inflammatory versus non-inflammatory and age and sex consideration. For example, if there is a non-inflammatory arthritis above say 45 or 50 years old, it's most likely uh, osteoarthritis. Let us see what are the differential diagnoses of inflammatory monoarthritis presenting acutely or subacutely. There can be septic arthritis, reactive arthritis, hemophilia or crystal induced synovitis such as gout or CPPD disease. In chronic monoarthritis, the most important consideration diagnostic test is that of synovial fluid analysis. And for organisms such as Staphylococcus, Mycobacteria or Fungus, X-ray often asked but is seldom helpful in a case of acute monoarthritis unless there is cartilage or bone destruction. If chronic, these are the clinical distinguishing features uh, and with laboratory support. As all of you probably are aware that to distinguish these two conditions we take these parameters early morning stiffness that is if it is less than 30 minutes it's non-inflammatory if it is more than 30 minutes it's inflammatory pain that is worse in the morning and a raised ESR or C-reactive protein So I would tend to do these investigation in a case of acute or subacute inflammatory arthritis that is hemogram, ESR to confirm it is a inflammatory nature, chemistry, serum creatinine and uric acid, PT and APTT to exclude hemophilia, HIV, that's very important test, serological test for confirmation for HIV. Synovial fluid analysis to look for the cell count, viscosity, transudate or exudate, whether it has got proteinaceous, protein, uh, the protein of the synovial fluid is increased or not, crystals and organisms. 
This is gives a picture of a young boy with a left knee swelling of inflammatory nature and this boy presented with a history of four week swelling. We did a synovial fluid analysis, the crystals were negative and there were plenty of pus cells or white cells yet the culture was negative. Turn out that this boy has a reactive arthritis. Uh, take an example of a similar presentation where usually uh, in a middle-aged or elderly you can identify the arthritis by polarizing microscope. You can use the needle set crystals which are strongly negative for biofringes on the top that is that of a monosodium uret or of a uh, <coughs> these crystals can also be I am afraid that the second picture the bottom panel has not come out well going from a monoarthritis, we come now how to assess patients who have got backache. Backache is a very common presenting feature in patients uh, who, who presents to any hospital. And the paramount importance for the rheumatologist is to distinguish an inflammatory backache versus a non-inflammatory backache. Mind you that majority of the patients who have had backache are of mechanical nature and are non-inflammatory. Of the inflammatory back pain, I mean that the early morning stiffness is more than 30 minutes, the pain is more in the morning and it eases as the day progresses. The conditions of inflammatory backache are are a group of diseases which are categorized under seronegative spondyloarthropathy. They include ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy, arthritis associated with inflammatory bowel disease, and psoriatic arthritis. And what investigations we need? Obviously, the most important investigation is hematology and ESR. If the TLC count is very high, it can be of reactive arthritis, but even sometimes infective arthritis can give rise to a neutrophilic leukocytosis. CRP and rheumatoid factor, CRP again confirm whether it's of inflammatory nature. HLA B27 is usually positive in about between 70% in reactive arthritis to more than 90% in sp ankylosing spondylitis. However, it has no diagnostic role in the sense that one can be HLA B27 negative yet be a patient with seronegative spondyloarthropathy. X-rays of the sacroiliac joint, plain X-ray is shows sacroiliitis. But as we are gradually learning now that the sacroiliitis of ankylosing spondylitis, it's a quite a late finding. A emerging investigation is that of MRI which shows bone edema across the sacroiliac joint and in many cases these progress to well-defined radiological changes. This is a classical picture of an ankylosing spondylitis, the top panel shows that the sacroiliac joint is fused. The picture on the right, it shows early 
changes at the corners of the vertebrae. These are often referred to as Romanus lesion. You can see the a white is clear and actually the sharp corner has been nipped. The bottom panel, uh, the left hand side shows that a, a, good, a good sign of the patients with acclosing spondylitis, that of the squaring of the vertebra. You can appreciate the anterior vertebra margin is straight rather than curved and if you carefully observe between the two vertebrae there is a thin white marking that is adjoining to vertebra. These are called as syndesmophytes that is calcification of the longitudinal ligaments as opposed to osteophyte which is an age related changes seen in the vertebral body where there is transverse protrusion of the uh, of the bone from the vertebra. Syndesmophytes as is shown in the cartoon is a longitudinal extension from the vertebral body. Uh, this uh, this is a patient of a reactive arthritis showing in the axilla uh, acanthosis nigricans and the bottom picture is that of a psoriatic arthritis and you can see the x-rays the x-ray shows a small spur at where the plantar fascia is inserted this is called a calcaneal spur the top right hand panel is that of a psoriatic arthritis patient who have got pitting of the nails. And this is the classic papular scaly ras uh, in an annular fashion of psoriasis. This is a picture of a rheumatoid like deformity in a psoriatic patients with the psoriatic skin rash on the dorsum of the hand. And as you can see patients with polyarthritis, they, they, they can early have just puffiness of the fingers like spindling appearance, but as the arthritis sets in or get established, you get the typical deformity the swan necking deformity that is seen in the left third and the fourth finger. So in polyarthritis if they are of inflammatory uh, type if one would like to have a rheumatoid arthritis, a psoriatic arthritis and another thing is not mentioned here is that of systemic lupus. Systemic lupus erythematosus can have polyarthritis also. So we need investigations to confirm or exclude rheumatoid arthritis and they can be hematological, immunological and imaging. In early stage, hematological investigation, one is looking for, uh, or actually, the hemoglobin can be low, and the platelet count can be raised because of the acute phase response. The immunological parameters are CRP, that confirms it's a rheumatoid arthritis, a acute phase response, rheumatoid factor and antibodies to CCP are present in about 70 to 80 percent of cases of rheumatoid arthritis. Imaging in the early stages, x-ray I'm afraid doesn't tell much. One has to go in for ultrasound and MRI to appreciate the bone edema and erosion. After about one year of disease, one can see the typical changes of rheumatoid arthritis in the x-ray of the hands. 
A bit more elaboration of antibodies to CCP. It's diagnosed by ELISA. It's sensitive uh, and it is more sensitive than rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is uh, seen in 80% to 85% of rheumatoid arthritis and when positive it is associated with severe erosive disease with presence associated with extra articular manifestations. There is no point getting rheumatoid factor done again and again. If in the first occasion rheumatoid factor is negative, one can repeat the test after six weeks to confirm the negativity. Otherwise, once it is positive, you don't need to retest. Antibody to C CCP is targeted against uh, cyclic citrulline. It's an essential part of antigenic determinant. It's formed during cell differentiation from arginine. Peptidyl arginine deaminase enzyme converted and citrullination is a post-translational modification of the protein. In early synovitis, you can see if you concentrate uh, for rheumatoid factor that is more than 20. If, if we take more than 20 international unit, uh, out of rheumatoid arthritis, 61 patients, 34 were positive. Those which were not rheumatoid arthritis, only 6 were positive, giving rise to a sensitivity of 56% and a specificity of 82%. If we take rheumatoid factor of more than 50 international unit, the specificity increases to 97%, whereas the sensitivity drops 46. But the positive predictive value, the column that is seen in uh, the last column, that is 97%, which is quite good. Whereas antibody to CCP, you can see the specificity is 97% and positive predictive value of 95%. And if we combine rheumatoid factor more than 20 plus antibody to CCP, the specificity is almost 100%, yet we have a sensitivity only 20. Antibody to RA33 is nothing but our ANA-based test, a fluorescent-based test of an earlier version of CCP. You, you ignore that, uh, that, that no lab offers nowadays. We have all changed over to antibody to CCP. And you can see how useful antibody to CCP. This is a study where a cohort of undifferentiated arthritis were studied over a period of time to see the usefulness of this test for predicting development of rheumatoid arthritis. Of these 318 patients who presented at, as undifferentiated arthritis, ultimately 127 patients developed RA. And those who developed RA, they were ne those who were negative for CCP, only 25% developed RA and those who were positive for antibody to CCP, 93% developed RA. So the odds ratio is very good, 37.8 with a 95% confidence interval between 13.8 to 211. Images are helpful, but as I told, a X-ray of the hands can be normal. Yet, if you see the MRI, which is the picture that is just right to the X-ray, you can see the bone marrow fat is replaced at uh, in 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 the metacarpal head. Um, which are likely, which are 
erosions and this is another section showing the same and if you see the ultrasound you can see the gap between the shiny bones which which can also pick, pick up erosions uh, but MRI is superior to ultrasound uh, in confirming erosions in early arthritis and uh, here you can see erosions uh, in x-ray of the wrist you can see the ulnar styloid process is actually um, eroded the tip is blunted it is because of a uh, and, and this is a very early radiological sign of rheumatoid arthritis however if we see the serial x-rays uh, from the ACR collection of x-rays one can see a progressive uh, erosion appearing in the metacarpal head on the A which is the earliest film you see the metacarpal head very round and circular and you compare it with B on the left hand side of your screen you can see the blunting has given away to the rounded bone is giving away to a flattening appearance and in C you can see a definite erosion similarly patient with established rheumatoid arthritis at least of more than three years duration can have atlantoaxial subluxation as is seen in the cervical spine um, between the two yellow lines and the arrowheads and of course these are very advanced changes of rheumatoid arthritis uh, which are called as proteusioacetabuli where both the femoral head has actually pushed inwards uh, through the acetabular roof <laughs> one of the important immunological tests for confirming a diagnosis of systemic lupus is antinuclear antibody the antinuclear antibody is best tested by the standard way to test it is called immunofluorescence and here it tells you uh, the different patterns that is seen the you can see the middle one is called a homogeneous pattern as the cells that are used for this test they are called heptocells they have taken a uniformly green color with the chromosome taking of the stain this is called as a homogeneous pattern whereas the picture on the right where the the stain is not homogeneous but there the nuclear has taken up the stain that is called a speckled pattern and the left side of the pattern shows a centromere pattern so a positive ANA can be homogeneous or rim which is usually seen in patients with systemic lupus or drug induced SLE speckled pattern is that of ENA uh, speckled is due to antibodies to extractable nuclear antigens they are usually called as ENA they are seen in patients with SLE, MCTD, Sogren syndrome, systemic sclerosis and polymyositis and the centromere pattern that I showed you in the earlier slide is due to scleroderma or more commonly called these days as systemic sclerosis um, and it is a limited variety of systemic sclerosis that give rise to a scleroderma pattern so once an ANA is positive to know what is the antigenic specificity of ANA we have to go forward 
by ordering for antibody to double strand DNA and antibody to ENA. The antibody to ENA are a heterogeneous group of autoantibodies that are directed to small ribonuclear proteins and they are RNP, SM, Rho or SSA, LA or SSB, SCL70 or JO1. And this was the classical way the ENA is tested by double immunodiffusion. You have these uh, agarose gel which are have wells surrounding wells in a circular fashion, in a rim fashion, and in the central well we have the antigens, that is the thymic extract, and as you can see, the picture on the right, if the reference sera is of antibody to SM, which is loaded on the top at the zero hour, and on both uh, on the two o'clock position well, the sera has got a precipitin line that is matching that the line tip is well uh, joining the other precipitin. It means that it, there is a line of identity and suppose a reference sera is of antibody to SM, the unknown sera which is put in different dilution in, um, at 2 o'clock, at uh, 3 o'clock, at 6 o'clock and at 8 o'clock and at 10 o'clock position of the hour, uh, they, they the precipitin line matches. Compare that with the uh, gel picture, agarose gel picture, which is taken in the petri dish. Um, and here you can see that the reference sera above SM, that is the antibody to SM, that is the reference, the, the sera that is, the serum sample that is loaded in just adjacent in a clockwise fashion to the right, the precipitin line actually crosses the two line, which means that this sera have antibody which is reacting against some nuclear extract, but it is not antibody to SM. It could be antibody to U1RNP or LA, but the line crosses. If you, this is called as a line of no identity. To confirm the specificity, western blot is used where the thymus extract or any nuclear extract is uh, electrophoresed and then transplotted into a nitrocellular membrane and the the patient sera is react, reacted to it and from the molecular weight markers um, you, you one can see the uh, various antibody specificity because the molecular mass of each of these antibodies are different. For example, this is an antibody to SM with polyreactive bands, band at 16 uh, and uh, 32, 72, 68 and these are the SM reactive bands. These bands, uh, these three bands, their antibody to LA, LA which appears around 45 kilodalton. Fortunately, to make the re detection easy, one now have 
from commercial company strips where these antigens are blotted is, uh, already and one has just to coat the sera with it and um, one can develop this strip in a couple of hours time and with a reference sera so one knows the uh, one can do uh, confirm the western blot for uh, the 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 ANA reactivities or ENA. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I would stop here except that for SLE we need antibodies to double strand DNA uh, which is usually tested by ELISA An antibody to double strand DNA is a marker for um, the nephritis it's useful in patients with SLE not only for diagnosis because it's very specific also uh, its level fluctuate with disease activity the other two tests that are useful in lupus setting is complements level usually complement fragment C3 and C4 are tested and their results are usually uh, uh, their levels are low in cases of active SLE. I would uh, stop here uh, to take any questions. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.